Hi, everyone. This is Jason Burak of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. It's Dave Skarika of Addicted for Profits. Uh, he's a good investor. He's a contrarian value investor, kind of like myself. Um, before we talk about his new book, which is Collapse, How the Federal Reserve Created Another Stock Market Bubble and Why It Will Collapse, which Dave just released recently, uh, I, I want to get his thoughts on – why he thinks uh, – uh, his last book, which is The Great Super Cycle, Profit from the Coming Inflation Tidal Wave and Dollar Devaluation, and what he thinks has changed then from writing his last book to why he wrote his uh, newest book. So thank you for joining us, Dave. Yeah, thanks for having me, uh, Jason. Um, really what has happened that's changed is my long-term secular view kind of remains the same, that I believe that um, – see, I believe in just cycles. So – it's nothing personal against any country or, or, or a system or whatever, but it's, it's more that I believe that there's these stock market cycles and within the context of massive geopolitical cycles and the rise and fall of nations and empires, and, and, and they kind of all implode the same way. So my macro, macro big picture cycles that the United States is slowly going to become like the British or Roman empires and kind of implode within itself, which doesn't mean, by the way, the end of the world. Like, for the most part, other than the last five or six years since the financial crisis, and other than, like, uh, during the mid-70s, you know, Britain has been a pretty prosperous country since the 1950s and is the first world country, and London is a major financial and social center of the world. So it, it's, it's not like it has to be the end of the world. It just means that at, on a macro level, your empire kind of has to shrink, and usually you have to go through some kind of debt crisis uh, to get there. And, and Britain was really easy after they were basically bankrupt after World War II. They had to implode the empire and dismantle the empire because they could no longer um, uh, afford it. Um, they didn't have the tax base to do it. The U.S. dollar took over as the, the main currency in the world, so they couldn't you know, print money to do it. They couldn't borrow to do it. So that, that, that had to implode. So that's my macro theme which I still believe in. I still believe that longer term up, you know, over the next 10 or 20 years, that emerging markets, frontier markets will outperform the major markets of the West. Um, I think what's happened, where maybe my, as, uh, my view has changed a bit, that when the Fed started all this quantitative easing and easing, uh, this is where maybe I've changed now. I thought, and this actually was a, uh, a misallocation by myself, and I did somewhat correct it in 2012, that I thought this money would all flow into commodities and emerging markets and out of the dollar, um, similar to maybe the Yang Kerry trade where, you know, none of this money was being really invested in Japan, but obviously was going to speculate all over the world in the 90s and 2000 uh, booms in global stocks. So I thought this money would leave the U.S. and kind of you know, prop up these economies that are growing a lot faster. But it, we got that for only 18 months or two years, yeah, though, right? We actually for two did... years. See, actually, I kind of was – I, I kind of did the wrong – because I can admit when I'm wrong on like most of these uh, guys we see on TV nowadays. Um, I kind of actually had it flipped over because what happened was those, those – the commodities got reinflated for two, three years. And I thought the stock, oh, yeah. I thought the stock market was actually only going to be related for two, three years. I thought it was going to be more like the 74 to 76 rally after the, um, you know, the 74 bear market yeah. market. Or one of these rallies that lasted two to three years, but instead we have another five market rally, very similar to 02 to 07. Or I think um, actually that's because of the Fed, the Fed. Well, and, think, and flight capital. Yeah, actually okay. the most comparable scenario right now. I've been throwing this around and I talk about this in the section of the book. Um, is 1932 to 1937 in that you had a collapse, you had a banking crisis. And the federal, you know, uh, Roosevelt closed down the banks. They did the, you know, um, they, they basically put the bad banks out of business. They devalued the dollar, which back then was by, you know, uh, revaluing gold from 20 to 35 an ounce. And then the Federal Reserve was also quite expensive. And it's and they quite a huge stock too, right? market rally and a rebound from the financial crisis and depression uh, where unemployment fell from 25% at the bottom of the depression to 14%. And the stock market, the Dow rally from 42 to 194, and that took about five years. But then what happened in 1937 is Roosevelt decided, and by the way, the, the federal government, and this is, I think the federal government then, we can relate to the, the Federal Reserve now. Well, the Federal Reserve has gone from $500 billion in the balance sheet to over $4 trillion. 
the federal government went from spending $4.2 billion a year to over $9 billion a year by the time 1937 had rolled around. So he more than doubled the size of the federal government, which, of course, was obviously, in terms of the GDP cal uh, calculation, stimulative. So by 36, 37, I think what happened was people started to think that the government could do no wrong. This, this recovery was kind of here to see, stay. Like now, there wasn't as much public participation in stocks as there was in 29, but there were still some pros. There were still some rich people in the market, you know, the quote unquote 1%. And if you read the articles from Wall Street Journal and the whatnot, and Zero Hedge had a great article on this, um, you'll see, again, the commentary is very similar to today. People didn't think the market could go down. People thought that it, you know, um, that, that it was going to keep going up. The Dow, which again almost went to 200, um, they thought they were going to go back to 250, et cetera, et cetera. And then as Roosevelt kind of rolled back the spending, which I'm relating to today as rolling back the tapering, because he wanted to um, just – there was two reasons. Number one, it was an experiment. He wanted to see how the um, – there were some internal documents to show this. They wanted to see how the economy could do on its own without the government stimulus. And number two, they actually wanted to balance the budget. So as much as maybe a lot of us don't like Roosevelt, think he's a, you know, um, kind of a, a very Keynesian type liberal, he actually at least was trying to keep the books somewhat in order at that time. But what happened is the market basically tanked. There's actually no one ever talks about 1937. It was essentially a crash that, that the, summer and fall. The, the, the taxes were still sky high, though. That's why the market crashed. And um, in congressional testimony, sorry to interrupt you, Dave, but in congressional I really testimony, think it was, I'm sorry, I really think it was it was all this liquidity based. You know, I think it was they took back liquidity. I, like taxes play a part. Don't get me wrong, but the, the, the business the business owners that were alive during then, unless they were getting a government contract, you know, to build a bridge well, or something like that, 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 that they hated FDR. That's my point. That when they rolled back that spending. There were less of those contracts are going down, and it was basically an inflated bu bu a mini bubble or bull market by the federal government, and the market cannot really operate on its own. And there was a 50% decline in the stock market. And the equation I'm using now, without this cheap money from the Fed, and without you know the corporations able to borrow at cheap money, able to you know uh, uh, you know. Uh, banks and speculators don't have to worry about buying government bonds because the Fed is buying it for them, that they can go speculate in risk assets. And as this taper gets taken away, that is when we'll see our kind of um, a decline. And just the last thing to end here, um, that in July of this year, when they tapered to $25 billion, and Kyle Bass has talked about this as well, the, the, t the, the stimulus has basically subsidized the deficit. And I know some of that stimulus goes with the MBSs, but still, roughly, if you just look at simplistic terms, when they did the $85 billion, the deficit was roughly $85 billion a month. It was about $90 a month. Now, right now, the deficit is shrunk, so the deficit is around $45 to $50 billion a month. They're paying $45 a month. They'll go to $35 in a couple of weeks. When they're at $25, especially at $15 in September, it really, in my opinion, no longer ceases to be stimulative. $15 is basically like you might as well not even free. Printing money is so small. So I think that is when the market can start running into crop troubles. And I don't know if it will crash then. I don't know if we'll see a big bear market next year after they start the taper. But I do think within the next year or two, you're going to see a big decline in the stock market as the stimulus is taken away. And I think once the ball gets rolling, it's kind of like the financial crisis in 2007, 2008. The Fed cannot cut rates or print more money or whatever to stop it. Once that ball gets rolling in a bear market, the momentum, it's like a snowball going downhill. Um, they just can't stop it. Remember, the Fed actually began to loosen monetary policy in the middle of 2007, actually near the top of the market when it cracked in August of 2007. So I don't think that even if, say, the market begins to roll over this fall and they begin to print more, that in the first part of the bust, they'll be able to stop it. Like, for example, one of the reasons is, this is my final point, is that margin debt as a percentage of GDP is actually higher now than it was in 2000, 2007. So I just think everybody is over leveraged right now. And remember, I know you're talking about higher taxes and I'm talking about stimulus. A lot of what plays the part in, in markets is, is sentiment. This is actually going to John Templeton. Um, he used to say that you want to buy maximum pessimism and the time to sell is at the time of maximum optimism. And if you look at anything from the VIX to investors intelligence, 
to the right X ratio. These are all things I talk about in my book, by the way. We're all seeing signs that the, the optimism is way, way, way overboard right now. Now, the problem with a bubble or with an overextended bull market is, as the old saying goes, it can stay irrational longer than you can stay liquid. So the, we don't know when this is going to end. Is it going to the top today? Is it going to top in the S&P to 2,000, 2,200? Who knows? But one thing I can tell you is due to the artificial nature of this bull market and all the stimulus the Fed has thrown at it, and all you have to do is look at a chart of, of the S&P since 2012. As soon as they started that $85 billion a month, that's when we kind of began the parabolic curve, especially in a lot of bubble sectors like the biotechs, like the 3D printing stocks, like the internet stocks, like the airlines. All the, all the sectors that have gone parabolic started right when they started that stimulus, and I don't see that as a coincidence. So, so why I wrote the book I just explained is that essentially when they began to print that $85 billion a month, and really over the second half of 2013, I basically began that to think that they were creating another bubble. It just wasn't this two, three year bull market into 2011, 2012, like I thought it was going to be when I wrote my first book or my last book in 2009, it became more dangerous. So that's why I decided to write this book. Well, I, I mean, all, all they can do, Dave, at this point, they're Keynesians, all they, and they, they don't believe in small businessmen or entrepreneurs really to be able to invest and create the economy. If you go back and read Keynes's general theory, he even says it that he doesn't believe that um, entrepreneurs and small businessmen can rationally invest as well as the rational central planner, government bureaucrat, intelligentsia with a PhD can, can allocate capital into the jobs in private sector. But, I mean, these guys want to create asset bubbles. Um, I interviewed Fabian Calvo, who's a real estate expert. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. Yeah, yeah I know. But, okay, so Fabian was saying that the Fed actually put in – 130 billion into the economy more than the 85 billion that they were stating and that he had people friends of his contacts of his hedge fund people because he he does over 500 million dollars a year in real estate deals that would get private door meetings with fed governors who would say we have to create another bubble we have to force the real estate market up we have to get the builders to start building again and we have to you know do what it takes to get the stock market up and the real estate market up and the bond market um at least stabilized, so the banks have you know better collateral. Looks like everyone has better assets for the wealth effect and other reasons. So um, yeah, I, I mean, the, the they obviously I, I don't think they're thinking about the long term. The people that are putting these policies in play, Dave, I don't think they're thinking about the, five or ten. The, the most famous current Keynesian, Paul Krugman, talked about that in the early 2000s after the dot com bust and mm -hmm. uh, the 9/11 recession. That he talked about, that there's, a, there's, a, there's a couple of quotes people took out of his writings from the New York Times where he said they need to create another bubble, right? So yeah. that's what happened. And I think what's going to be really bad about the busting of this bubble as opposed to 2007, 2001 is bad because, you know, whatever, a bunch of tech stocks deflated, but people still had equity in their homes. Well, they lost that 2007, 2008. And, but at least going into that bubble, people had equity. Now, most people don't even have any equity anyhow, and, you know, there's still like 20% of the homes in the United States are still underwater, and, and this is essentially what is probably at the top of the next economic cycle. So what happens this time around when, when these things, if I think happens, the bust happens within, you know, I think the bust is going to happen by the end of next year at the latest. And by the way, the only reason I think I would be delayed to the end of next year is that we could have a 2008, 2000. 2007, 2008 period where the market spends, you know, a year topping before it just falls apart. I, again, I don't think that's going to happen this time. I think when the top happens, regardless if it's now, regardless if it's later in the year, it's going to be quite quick because of, yeah. of the nature of the parabolic move in the markets. But anyhow, um, um, I, so anyhow, I, I, no, I agree with you. Like, like you're basically proving the, the title of my book. My title of my book is Collapse how the Federal Reserve created another bubble and why it will collapse. So I don't know if they believe um, the second half. And where I totally agree with you, there have been Keynesians, and this is where I try not, because I'm trying to trade markets as a contrarian and looking for value, but I, I, I try not to get overly philosophical, other than my philosophical beliefs in how to buy markets, right, and sell mm -hmm. markets. But the one thing I believe what they believe, and I don't know how they can believe this after what's happened, is they believe that they can kind of stop maybe a bear market in its tracks, that 
um, you know, oh, whatever, there's a 10, 15 percent decline, it gets out of control, goes to 20 or 25. We can ramp up the pressing presses again and reinflate the bubble. But like I said, in the early stages, I think that, you know, you saw this with the Bear Stearns bailout, say, in the March of 2008, when the early stages of the bus start happening and that snowball starts going down the hill, mm-hmm. they're not going to be able to stop that. Now, maybe if they print enough money and devalue the dollar after the initial bust, they can make the stocks go up because they're basically, you know, the, the dollar's worth you know, losing value, but but I think the initial bus, they're going to have no control over. And the last reason, and just to finish off here, I think the initial bus will be worse too, is that if you actually look at what's going on in the markets right now, the volumes have really dried up. I'm sure you've seen that. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of studies showing up there right now that <laughs> a majority of the buying that is going on is, is stock buybacks and things of this nature. So there's no or computer or the computers, right? The, the computers trading against computers. Yeah, yeah, like, like for example, look at the airlines right now. That that's a sector I've begun to short here. And like Delta Airlines in 2012, in December 2012, was under ten dollars a share, and now it's forty two dollars a share. So you know, like, and, and you can just see the way it's traded. It's just computer money going into that and selling back and forth to each other, and kind of like the internet stocks or 3D printing stocks that earlier in the year. When that trend reverses in the airlines and some of the other stocks that have gone parabolic, then they're going to all, because they're all going to be selling to each other. And then, um, you know, then the buy, then, you know, even if credit is loose in terms of interest rates being low, as you know, in a recession, like something 2008, even if rates are low, credit can be tight. So, you know, corporate, oh, yeah. corporate bond yields may jump in a recession and these companies cannot borrow and then they cannot buy back their own stock. So that, got, that gets rid of that buffer underneath the market, too. And by the way, stock buybacks aren't that bullish. Um, if you actually look at the history of them, like the highest amount of stock buybacks and records is going to be this year. But the second highest before that was 2007, which, of course, was a major top of the market. Well, I mean, the CEOs are going to try to buy back shares no matter if the, their stock is up or down because that's the scam that they run, them and the board of directors, yeah. so they can beat earnings, financially engineer earnings beats, so they can get their stock options to trigger any way they can. No, you're right. And then, of course, that, like, you know, that's something that, say, IBM has been very good at because IBM has had no growth for years. But as you buy back your shares, less shares become outstanding. You can meet your EPS numbers. The stock can at least hold up or go up. Um, you can you can get performance or stock bonuses, and as you said, that's kind of that, that's kind of the, the, the big scam. But again, and this is where we do get a bit philosophical. That you, you know, if you are if you are um, like an Austrian economist, you could argue this is all enabled by the Fed, right? Because yep, artificially cheap debt. Yeah, right? yeah, because they they are artificially suppressing interest rates. This allows go- and, and let's face it, a corporate five, or, or, sorry sorry a Fortune 500 company. An IBM, a Walmart, a McDonald's, a Apple, they have no problem um, going to the debt markets and borrowing where a small business right now does. So, so they're just kind of subsidizing all of this right now. So I think at some point, the law of averages do, you know, will work and the market will win out. And you'll see essentially a big decline in, in, in the stock market. You know, and I, it's mm-hmm. not, I don't think as on. Um, well, I mean, I mean, rationally, we should have already had one yeah. already. I'm surprised the markets have gone up this much because obviously the fundamental stuff is just not there. The largest companies are not even growing their revenue at 5%. It's all on manufactured earnings per share growth or leveraged buyout. The, the size of the leveraged buyouts, Dave, that we are seeing are enormous. Yeah, and, and by the way, in terms of the earnings – uh, but no one ever looks at price to sales, right? Price to sales yeah. is one of my key indicators because um, it's a great valuation metric. In low growth industries, you usually have low price to sales. But if you look at roughly the, the history of the S&P 500, it trades around 1.2 to 1.3 times sales, right? And, and um, actually, one reason you see stocks were cheap in 2009, and that's why you couldn't look at price to earnings in 2009 because, you know, the E evaporated because of all the huge paper losses on the banks and the whatnot. And um, but in 2009, the price of sales was actually 0.065. So stocks actually were trading roughly at a 40 to 30 percent discount to the historical average based on price to sales. Well, price to sales in the dot com bubble topped because of the market exploding with 1.8. Price to sales right now is 1.69. 
So the uh, so actually it's, it's yeah. even higher because you know, this is how much the market's rallied just recently. It's actually 1.75. And, and I wonder if that's counting the channel stuffing that GM and Green Mountain Coffee Roasters. Sure, this and is just going on the pure numbers. This is the S&P 500. So, so essentially, the, the all-time high in price to sales um, you know, is just over 1.8 in the year 2000 during the bubble. So we're, we're almost back to those levels, which shows you that – I'm sorry, I, I'm corrected. It was actually 0 0.8 in the 2009 bubble, which means that stocks were roughly like uh, about 30% undervalued by – historical or normal standards. And, and just to finish off, in terms of we're talking about these indicators, um, I'm not a perma bear. I'm not one of these guys always screaming the sky is falling. Uh, you know, in 2009, I was really bullish. In 2012, I was buying Greece, of all places. You know, so uh, I'm someone who looks for value and looks for contrarian opportunities. But right now, when, for example, another indicator, you have stock market capitalization in the United States as a percentage of GDP, at about 130%, and the all-time high, again, was 2,000, at 150%, even before the financial crisis, it only got to about 110%. When you see that kind of overvaluation, I'm really, really, really negative. And this whole price to earnings, where people go, oh, you know, the market's only seven times, 17 times current earnings and 15 times forward earnings, that's a bunch of BS because of these things we talked about, the ability to borrow low, um, you know, there's no wage pressure, there's um, all, all of these kind of one-offs, has kept margins artificially high, and that you know. So so really, if margins were like if, if interest rates were at historical levels and margins were at historical levels, the market would probably be trading at a thirty to forty percent discount where it is today. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Vitaly Katzenelson, if you're familiar with his work, he has some uh, very good uh, articles there about the uh, profit margins, how uh, they mean revert normally, and they're at all time highs, and they've been. Uh, basically a parabolic curve, I think, since 2000. They've been going up, like, really way too high since 2009. They've never gone up at this high a pace before. Yeah, and and so, another, um, another interesting note is that they've actually started to crack. Uh, there was a big decrease in profit margins in the last, you know, three, four months. And if you look at, like, the 2007 or 2000 tops, they often – and margin of debt, by the way, started to crack, too. Those indicators actually lead the market usually by three to four months. So if they started crack, say, in about April, that was about the last numbers I saw, you know, we're actually in a time over the next month or so where the market sh should I, make uh, maybe, you know, some form of top. And just I, the last note, I believe in seasonalities. And if you look mm -hmm. at times like 2007, um, uh, 1990 bear market, the 98 financial crisis, the 87 crash, the 27, the 29 crash, actually the summer is quite often is seasonally a time when you can see, like, um, a major top and then decline into, you know, the fall. And if you are, like myself, looking for a short and sharp decline, which is essentially like a crash or a mini crash, you know, it would actually make sense that we top here over the next few months and move down in the fall. And actually coordinates with the Fed's tapering that will happen sometime in the summer. I mean, the tapering getting really small in like the kind of late July to mid-September period. And uh, if I could add some points there, um in terms of why the U.S. stock market is cracking with the profit margin stuff, I think it's because the U.S. consumer is basically crapped out. Yeah, they're, um, they, they don't, their discretionary spending is done. You have Obamacare, uh, which is drastically increasing health care bills. You have uh, your utility bills, cable bills, food prices are going up. Uh, rents, even on the government's own numbers, rents are exploding for rent, uh, rent, rent charges. Um, and I, I think the U.S. consumer, basically, the government saying it's a recovery, and maybe there are pockets, small little pockets of recovery in the shale oil boom in the Bakken in North Dakota, in Texas, um, in a small factory towns and jobs in small states like Kentucky or South Carolina or Tennessee or Alabama, and in, and of course in Silicon Valley where there's still you know profitable tech companies that are doing well, but that's not the whole country though, Dave. So that's I, I think we're saying at most maybe that's what 20% of the whole U.S. economy because the whole U.S. Econ mo the majority of the U.S. economy is still designed on consumer spending and real estate market and car purchases and big discretionary and, budgets and healthcare and working right? in service-based industries, right? You. Yeah. Yeah. Or financial, whatever. Like you, you, you know, you, you, you live in your suburb, you get in your car, you get to work, you, you, know, you go work for Wells Fargo or Hershey or wherever you're working for, like a big company, or you're in a small business, and it's usually a consumer-based business. And, and you know, that, that lifestyle, you're right, for most people, 
has not changed. And of course, in the paper markets, those booms in those industries have kind of papered over the fact that that's happened. And um, so just to finish off on kind of like the stock bubble phase, and then we'll go into, you know, where we see some opportunities. And so like, how do you, can you do so? How can you prop from this or how can you like protect yourself? Is so right now I'm doing, I have a trading service where we trade options and the whatnot. And, um, and I also have my, my main service, Addicted to Profits. I also have a trading service of Addicted to Profits, um, which is a little more sophisticated in trading. But like one story I always tell people is that Martin Zwei, who was a famous fund manager in, in, the, in the 80s, became famous because he essentially called the 1987 crash. Uh, when he became worried about the parabolic move in the market, at that time the Fed was tightening vis-a-vis actually raising interest rates. How novel is that? Yeah, the Fed used to raise rates. <laughs> But, uh, he, he noticed a similar price action to cracks in the market in uh, 1946 and 62 when similar things happened. So he bought November put options on the S&P that were 8% out of the money. He put 1% of his portfolio on it. And uh, he was only 40% invested at the time because he was worried about a potential market break. Long story short, he sold these put options during the crash for an average gain of about 2,000%. And the, his fund actually nice. went up 9% the day of the crash. And so I would tell people now that if you look, sounds like Kyle Bass type of returns there. Yeah, if you if you kind of like even if you're bullish, if you kind of look at maybe some long dated put options, maybe for November December of this year. You know, because I said like usually you have this historical anomaly where crashes happen in the fall. You know, maybe something like uh, in a high flying stock or in the S and P or Nasdaq or whatever. You put one or two percent of your money in there. If I'm wrong and the market doesn't tank, big whoop, right? You, you, mm-hmm. you lose 1% or 2% of your portfolio. If I'm right, your other 80% of your portfolio could go down 30%. These options could potentially go up thousands of percent. And that right now with the VIX at 10, there's essentially no premium in these options. And you essentially protect your portfolio. Like in the Bahamas, because we live in hurricane zone, I have to buy hurricane insurance. The insurance here is 1% the value of your home. But you buy it every year because if you do get a hurricane and your house is destroyed, you know you, you get to rebuild it. So that is the same, the same reason people should buy physical gold. Still, yeah, you right? still buy physical gold. Insert. You could buy, and that, by the way, I think that gold in this next bear market is really interesting. We'll get that in the next segue here because I think it is actually truly going to trade contrary to the market now, like it should have, you know, like more like it did in 2000 and 2002. But but, yeah. but anyhow, um, so I think you know some long dated put options are are um are a very good way to use insurance right now, you know, or buy even though they erode over time. Maybe look at buying at some of the double leverage, uh, you know, um, uh, or even uh, triple leverage, or more of the double leverage. Those, those things reset, though, every day, I, I though, right? So people have day, to be careful. In a crash well, scenario, they'll do mm-hmm. quite well. Or, uh, 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 like, go look, even go look at the correction of um, 2011, for example. Um, you know, they did, like, for example, the SRTY, that's the, tri- that's the uh, double, or the, the triple short, actually, of the Russell 2000. It went yep. from 300 to 600 during a 20% correction. Yeah. So in, in, a, in a, that kind of scenario, they can do quite well. Obviously, you have to be nimble, and, and when they spike up, you sell them. That's the same thing in put options. But as you said, let's do our next segue. Um, um, you know, we, we, we were talking before the show. Um, so, again, I'm just saying just look at those things as, as a insurance. So where do we see, like, value? You were talking before the show about uh, John Templeton. And in – Chapter eight of my book, the last chapter, I talk about kind of the two philosophies, and I'm not talking about economic philosophies. I'm talking about trading and market philosophies that I adhere to. And they're basically Templeton, which is maximum pessimism, which means you buy assets when they're unwanted, when there's high levels of fear, when they're unvalued. Obviously, most stock markets around the world in 2008 to 2009 would have fit this criteria. And right now, despite the huge run-up, in the S&P and in uh, most of the first world markets, the DAX, the FTSE, you know, those things, there's actually a lot of value around the world. As, as I noted, um, my philosophy was a lot of this money would flow into emerging markets and commodities. Well, it did till 2011, but now all of those have come back and corrected. And if you look at a lot of actually valuations on emerging markets, I don't think there's a hurry to go out and buy those because if there is a down leg in the U.S. stock market, they may get taken down one more time before they start, uh, you know, another cyclical bull market. But um, I think when you look at a lot of the emerging markets, actually Russia is one of the cheapest markets in the world. I obviously know there is a bit of a political premium going on there right now because 
what's happened in Crimea and recently. But if you actually look at the TRF, yeah, yeah. which is a Russian fund, the chart is beautiful. There's this huge multi-year base going yeah. down. Um, it may fall to the bottom end of that base if there is um, – Isn't 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 Rosneft, which is a um, publicly traded uh, Russian oil stock on the London exchange, isn't only trading at two times yeah. earnings or some, ridic- yeah, some ridiculous value? Gazprom trades at two times or three times earnings. And even if these are not very well companies that are government, basically government run political tools, right? Um, Yeah. Which some people would say they are, but still, they're so cheap. If you get some kind of revert to the norm, and this is essentially what maximum pessimism is, is let's just say Gazprom or, 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 you know, the company you mentioned, they go back to trading to seven times earnings. Well, that's a triple, that's a gain of two, three to two to three hundred percent from current levels. So I think, uh, you know, the Russian and some of the, Eastern European equities look uh, good. Uh, a market I'm looking at is Turkey. Not right now, but if there is the continued tapering and you get that trade where, you know, liquidity comes out of emerging markets because, you know, there's less liquidity going around the world. And c- Turkey's a, pro- a country that has a problem with its current account deficit, has kind of crony capitalism. It's similar to actually a lot of the Asian countries in the late 80s, or sorry, late 90s, mm-hmm. when they had their crisis then. If, but, Tur- but Turkey's long-term fundamentals are actually okay. So that, that's like another market I'd be looking at. But essentially, I'd be looking at a lot of emerging markets. Because if I'm right and the market crashes, um, what will happen is um, they'll respawn well, by upping QE. I think this time around, the QE, you never reinflate the old bubble. Like the bubble in the mid-2000s was what? Real estate. Um, you know, the stock market didn't have as, a huge parabolic move as it is today. Um, real, it was more real estate. Uh, emerging markets, commodities, uh, those things all, all went crazy in the mid-2000s. And this time when they reinflated the bubble, they reinflated tech again and, and you know, 3D printing and et cetera, et cetera. Social media. Yeah, social media. Th- those are the parabolic groups. Again, I said, if you actually look at a chart of the airlines, it, amazing enough, airlines have gone parabolic. But um, – uh, well, yeah, because they have the, the the traders, the computers are seeing all this cheap shale oil, right? And they think, oh, the U.S. is going to keep doubling oil production every two or three years, not seeing that the shale oil producers here in the U.S. are rapidly increasing their debt, growing their debts faster than they're growing revenues. Well, I think the one thing about any boom is that the, the, the move off the bottom is the easiest. And again, it goes to maximum pessimism is that actually it was kind of like maximum pessimism in the oil patch in the United States when – Essentially, oil production from 1970 into 2005, 2006, halved in 37 years. So the first move, and we've gone basically went from about 10 million barrels a day to five, and now we're back at around, I think we're back to about eight. So that first move is the easy oil to find because there was essentially no exploration for almost 40 years. So that that was the easy stuff to find, and now it's going to be more difficult and difficult uh, to, to increase that production. So uh, so, so, so again, I think it reflects these other bubbles, but also there's real value in those markets. Again, if you want to put your toe in the water now, fine, but I really don't see any hurry until about the fall because if I'm correct, and or even for the next year or so, if it doesn't happen in the fall, if when the U.S. markets have a large decline, and go look at 2011, go look at 2008, you know, go look at even corrections in like 2004, when the U.S. market has a tumble, Usually, you know, other markets do fall with it. So I'd be picking my spot in those markets. Those are the markets like their long-term Cape ratios, their long-term case shiller 10-year moving average PD ratios. Of actually, a lot of those markets move to the high single digits to low double digits. We're in the U.S. right now. It's about 26, 27 times earnings, and it's smoothed out 10-year. So those markets represent a lot of value, and that's kind of what Templeton – would talk about. And then we go to another market that's value is the gold and precious metals market. And one chart that I show actually twice in my book, so I think it is such a good chart. It's by a guy named Maybane Faber, mayfaber.com, um, is the return on assets after they fall between 60 and 90 percent in price. And essentially after a sector falls 80 to 90 percent in price, the average three-year return is about 200 percent. So the GDXJ, which is, represents the junior gold miners, has fallen 80% in price from its 2011 high. And I've done another study, which I've shown that if you go look at the 2,000 bust in stocks, the 29 bust stock in stocks, 89 in the Nikkei, 80 in gold, all bubbles that burst, and you could say that gold stocks were a mini bubble, or gold was a mini bubble in 2011, but all bear markets, when they burst, 
don't tend to last longer than three years without at least a six month bull market in between. So now we look at the gold market and we'll see that August of this year is three years since, you know, it bonds. And uh, in the stocks, actually, the junior stocks is actually March of 2011. <clears throat> so they're over three years into the bear market. And the seniors, it's um, the four, October 2011. So they're two and a half months. And even the 29 to 32 Great Depression was only 30 months in late. In terms of 32 months in like in terms of the stock to, amount of decline. So everything to me in terms of the um, valuations, like, you know, Derek, for example, was trading at five times sales back in 2011. Now it's actually closer to trading right at sales. So all of these valuations are now cheap. The miners are cheap. There's a lot of smaller miners that are trading at or maybe only uh, two times cash flow, which is ridiculously cheap. And um, these are the type of things that can really move. And from a seasonal standpoint, I, I think I'm showing an upcoming newsletter on gold and precious metals miners. If you look at this May-June period going back the last 11 or 12 years, you'll see that only one time, that was the 2008 financial crisis, did not buying in May or June result in at least a 20 to 50% rally within the next three to six months in the miners. And on the charting side, if you look at the GDXJ or the GDX or the HUI, there is a potential that if we do not break down within the next month or two, that we're forming a major reverse head and shoulders bottom. Yeah, I think if John Templeton were alive today, I think the precious metal miners or uh, maybe since they generate more free cash flow, the royalty and streaming companies, because those are safer than um, some of the miners. Well, actually, um, he never was... liked gold. He was actually one of these – he never he was, he was kind of an anti-gold bug, but – one thing that was interesting about him is that one of, the, again, the famous trades he made was in the early 90s when the HY and a lot of the mining stocks, he saw actually, uh, I think it was 92 or 93, he actually saw that the miners were really cheap based on cash flow and PDEs and the whatnot. So he bought, he bought a lot of the larger, obviously, like, you know, base metal miners and that sort of thing. So, yeah, I agree with you. I think if he was alive today, maybe he'd be looking at more, again, of the, the, those type of miners. But... I think I think he would be looking at some mining and commodity companies. And what's interesting about commodities as a whole is you go look at the CCI. I don't like the CRB. I like the CCI because it's more well balanced with all commodities. The CRB is too um, in, uh, too influenced by um, energy for my liking. But if you look at it after the 2008 crash, which took about uh, away about half the game from 01 to 2008. Um, uh, there was another huge spike into 2011, and really what's going on since 2011, <coughs> excuse me, looks like a huge consolidation in the miners. Like essentially, this, the CCI, which began this bull market at 183 in 2001, moved to 614 at the top in 2008, went to 323 in 2008, went to 690, is now consolidating between 500 and 600. Um, so I think that we can continue to consolidate. Like I said, if again, if there is a big dump in the U.S. markets that will probably hold back commodities shorter term, but this consolidation should continue. And we'll, if you look at it, if, if 500 was our low on the CCI this time, and the last two moves were basically 200 and 100%, we're probably going to 100, 1,000 to 1, 000, to 1,500 on these commodities in the next major move. And what's interesting is that's an ultimate contrarian trade. If you look at the, you know, everyone three years ago believed in the, and um, it was funny because, you know, I was talking about super cycles. Everyone was calling it the commodity super cycle. Now they're all saying that is dead because of lower growth in China and India. But I argue, number one, I think that after this bust is over in China and uh, with these reforms going on in India, you're probably going to see their rates revert higher. The bust in China might still take another year or two. Uh, you know, their growth rates revert higher again. And then, you know, that's going to be yeah. demand commodities. But more, I think the next commodity boom is going to be based on this money printing. If I'm right, there's a big bust in the markets. The feds react to that market by money printing. Um, um, then uh, then I think that money will flow into commodities, and it'll be more of like a stagflationary type environment where commodities can be going up even while the economies are weak. 
And um, I, I don't think all commodities are created equal this time, Dave. I remember buying copper stocks. I bought Lundin Mine. I told you this off air. I bought Lundin Mining at thirty cents after two thousand and eight. It was run by Lucas Lundin, and it went to five dollars in less than two years. I don't think I'm not bullish on copper or iron ore or steel um, because those are too tied to China. You know, building. Uh, buildings really that are not doing anything that are not occupied that there's no one in uh, even if India were to start actually you know replacing some of their infrastructure I don't think it would pick up the slack the artificial demand that China's oh, had there the base but, um, metals I really don't have um, I, I don't have much uh, I don't think I have much reason to buy them in the short intermediate. Oh, oh I'm bearish on the base metal. Uh, yeah, uh, I just don't see any any reason to really get into them, especially with the carnage that has gone on in the precious metal sector. That is where the, again the real value lies. You know, you look at something like Freeport Macmoran or something like, you know, its stock has come down. It's not at the highs it was, but in terms of actual value and leverage in the stock, and obviously Freeport Macmoran is not going to collapse like all like all copper stocks because it has a, a lot of precious metal production as well right i think they've hedged their copper production a good amount of their copper production too to save the protect themselves some downside yeah so so exactly so i like but again there's there's no leverage in that stock i, I think like you talked about lending mining i think you want to buy the small to intermediate uh producers i actually don't have i talked about barrack being cheap but i don't have much interest in the larger producers the type of companies i'm buying right now are you know, small miners, the ones that I told you, they're maybe trading in only two times cash flow that um, um, that are so leveraged that, you know, if gold were to go to $2,000 an ounce, they're, they're going to be basically, you know, and I'm not the one to throw around these huge gains, but yeah, they're going to be 10 beggars if that happens. So uh, these are the kind of companies that I'm looking at right now. Can you talk about doing, like, I had a similar trade to yours, and I just wish I would own more of it, and a company called Consolidated Thompson, and that was actually an iron ore company, but you know, during the crisis in 2008, 2009, um, that stock got to under a dollar a share from a high of 10. And then it was, it was actually eventually taken over by an NYC listed company at north of $15 a share. So, nice. so, so those are the kind of, and that was a... But that's, that's just implemented being disciplined and having cash and implementing Templeton strategy, right? Because obviously we are thinking that so, chi, we didn't know for sure that China was going to do a huge stimulus plan, right? And start building all these extra buildings and stuff. But we knew that what these Keynesians would probably do, they wouldn't allow free market forces and full deflation, that they were going to tr start reflating some type of bubble somewhere. Yeah, yeah, ex exactly. That, 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 that's correct. So, so right now, like in terms of maximum pessimism, those are the sectors you want to look at. The, these sectors have gone down a great deal. They're very cheap. Um, I, they, I take a pronged approach because, you know, I think there can be this, like gold stocks, uh, you know, to be blunt with you, do not, you know, like even though they're, I think they're going to trade more counter to the market, and we'll get into this now. Like if you look at the 2000 to 2002 bear market, you know, the HUI bottomed at 38 and it went to 250 um, by about mid-2003, whereas, you know, the NASDAQ in that same time fell 80%. So I think we, we can be more counter to the market. Um, you know, in, in periods of fierce selling, like 2001, like uh, the summer of 2002, the gold stocks got taken down with the market. So as a word to the wise, if you do believe in my kind of negative scenario that we're going to see a very sharp round of selling, the gold stocks might temporarily get, you know, decline with that. So, but I think once that first wave of selling is finished. That, that would suck considering what people who, who are still holding gold and silver stocks have been through the last couple of years. <laughs> I don't think it's going to be like 2008. They're not going to fall 70% from here. You know, like, but, but well, actually my, my scenario actually is right now that if we, we begin to top out on the markets, that in the first move, it's kind of like uh, bonds have rallied recently. Um, the, the gold is going to anticipate the kind of market topping and what's ahead. And you're going to actually see the gold stocks maybe drop a, a jump 50 to 60 percent before but, the market really cracks badly. So and then they might give up, you know, a third of those gains or something when when the market really cracks. So but I think buying down here is a good contrary in play, you know. Oh, yeah, because I think I, I think China and India, their economies have small business growth there and their people there are focused on actually growing their economy and they they are both committed because of their culture and because they they do have some actual real growth in their economies. Uh, although China's miscalculated a lot of capital trillions, but anyway, though, 
um, their culture is just designed to save in precious metals. So I, I think we should just be, uh, even though we're not Chinese or Indian, I think it's smart. I, I don't know if you're continuing to dollar cost average, Dave, and buying more uh, physical metal as insurance, buying a little bit more silver or gold every single month. But when I have more money, I try to do that every month or every couple months and not care about the price just as insurance outside of my portfolio besides some of the stocks that we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I buy, you know, I, I will buy some physical. I will buy a little into these, like, smaller miners right now. Like I said, I'm keeping the position, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of averaging in on them right now because I think that's where the real value in the market is. And, 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 and right now, I think that's one of these sectors that has maximum pessimism. And, like, look, and I know the thing is, at a bottom, what you understand is the psychology of it, to kind of get back again to this kind of Templeton philosophy is the psychology is always, I actually, in my PowerPoint presentation for my fund and that I'm starting right now and, and just in general, talking about contrary investing, I always show these pictures and it's pictures of riots and people burning police cars and setting this, uh, a city on fire and, you know, police feeding protesters. And I say, you know, what country do you think it is? And what would you think if I told you this is the best performing stock market? in the world since 2012 and the country's Greece. And at the, at the bottom in 2012, the Greek market, um, the Athens stock exchange had fallen 95% from its 2000 high. And um, even from 2011, it had fallen about 80% in those two years or that year going into 2012. And it, the Greek market has rallied about um, about 200% since, and I actually at the time the, the company I really liked was HL Toy, which is the Greek telecom company, um, because telecoms are a nice leverage play on economies, etc. And that stock bottom at 71 cents, and we put in the newsletter about the 140s, and it's now almost eight dollars a share. So like right. that's the, and again, who would have been bullish on Greece in 2012? You know, it actually no one. come out now recently that a lot of the smart hedge fund managers, you know. <laughs> Um, the Paulsons, the Wilbur Rosses, these kind of people were actually taking some positions in Greece over the last couple of years, you know? So um, that, that's what it looks like. So now you look at the psychology, you know, everyone's positive in the stock market. It's funny, even people I know who are gold bugs and who are, ne who are kind of like perma bears, had discussions with them over the last week or two. They basically throw it in the towel telling me that they, they don't even think, the, you know, even Peter Schiff I saw in some interview recently said, he didn't think, you know, he thought that the Fed could keep everything inflated for a while. And the he also won't admit, though, that the gold and silver markets are manipulated, or at least like he didn't control for many years. So, I, yeah. I, I, so. I, I'll take it with a grain of salt with him. I, I, I respect Peter, but he's he's not always right on his market calls. He also, uh, like, had a chance to buy into Bitcoin below a dollar. I have a friend, Trace Meyer, who sat down with him for 30 minutes and tried to get him to put in, like, $10,000 into buying, you know, a ton of Bitcoins below a dollar, and he refused. So. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, and by the way, that was my learning lesson, by but, the way. But, but, but that's a good indicator, though, that you brought up. Well, well the thing about uh, even is that, yeah, it's just a good indicator. And I really saw this in last week. I know one guy who is a trader, and he had a lot of shorts on, and he actually just blew all his shorts out yesterday and Thursday after the ECB decision. So it's like you're seeing that kind of final capitulation in the bears. You know, and that's how bears would have felt in 2007 or 2000. You know, that's. That is just but the way markets the, work. And the, the, the funny thing, Dave, is that the paper price has kept going down, right? But when you look at the – we talked about this before we started recording. When you look at the actual supply-demand statistics of the physical metal, right, they've never been better for yeah, physical yeah, and demand. One thing we talked about, too, that's really going to have gold and silver is – see, I think what's happened in the West is you have such a financial-based mindset and economy and is – like it's almost like the printing press has replaced gold for more people. And maybe back in the financial crisis, there was a little more buying and whatever, whatever gold has come off. But now there's virtually uh, all of that gold has come out of vaults in the West and moved east, and it's never coming back. So if there ever is a, a big pent up demand, especially in the West, and you, you, you know, all you know it is if, if, if you hear people tra are traveling to um, like, like coin dealers and stuff, it's tough to get your hands on a whole big whack of gold, you know, gold and silver coins. So we know that, that at some point when there's a big trigger for physical demand in the West again, and I think a, a stock market crash and a resumption of QE would be kind of that trigger, that that is when it's going to go higher because there's no physical out there or very little physical out there. And it's all been shifted to Asia. 
and the miners are not making money. And the miners either. ain't they making no money. There's no incentive for them to provide any more supply, right? Oh no, there's, there's no exploration going on. You know, the, the, you know, exactly. there's no exploration going on in the markets, and 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 that's essentially, you know, that's what's going to happen in my opinion. You know. I, I completely agree. I, I think we're going to have supply shortages for sure as long as uh, demand in India and China stay strong, and then there's any kind of more swing demand for physical metal from either Europe, uh, people are panicking there with negative interest rates, or from Japan if the yen collapses, or from the U.S. if the Fed you know reverses the taper and goes for – uh, they actually announce in public that they're going to do 130 billion a month QE instead of actually, you know, hiding that they printed that money, uh, like Fabian Calvo said in the last like uh, 12 months before they started pulling yeah, the money. Yeah, out no, India. I agree. That's exactly what, what what's what's going to happen. And again, I kind of trigger it back to my roundabout analogy that one thing I didn't mention is that at the end of that is after the market tanked and the economy fell back into recession. He actually ramped up the government spending again, and of course, it really ramped up during World War II. So, like, like that's essentially what the Fed is going to do. They're doing this little experimentation with reining it in a bit. It's probably going to fail. It's and all the other all the other tapers have failed too, right? Because okay. QE one, right? They tapered. That's probably they tapered. the most important chart I have in my book. Is that mm -hmm. if you look at 2010 and 2011, is, is and remember back then it wasn't like they didn't. I think that's why they're trying to taper slowly this time. Back then, that was. Those QEs just ended, right? But, yeah, and then the market threw a taper, a large taper tantrum, right? There was a pretty decent correction of 10%. Yeah, yeah there so, was right? like a 15% correction in 2010, and there was a 19% correction, so almost a bear market in in um, in 2011. So you know, I, I you know, like the S&P fell actually um, fell almost three uh, from in, actually intraday it did fall over 20% from the um, uh, May high to the October low in 2011. So like, like, I think that, you know, th th that's what's going to happen. And so for like the short periods of time when they weren't printing money, the market acted miserably. And it's like you said, because consumers are tapped out. There's really no demand in the economy. So when it's not inflated by the Fed, Fed stimulus, and, and, and the danger also too with that is right now the stock market bubble is way bigger than it was in 2011, 2010. By then, we were still just rebounding from the financial crisis. You know, now we got bubbles in the 3D printing and social media, internet, and airline stocks are going parabolic. And you know, real estate too. There's construction cranes almost every uh, DC metro area and so many other areas. We're hearing stories from a lot of our listeners on our podcast because we have a pretty wide network now that people are saying there's enormous construction all over the United States again, that we're back to, in some cases I hear, 2006, 2007 levels before the crash. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of uh, yeah, and a lot of commercial markets for sure. So these are things to all like kind of be worried about, and the warning signs are all there. And um, and then actually the last thing I'd like to get back to the markets, you know, we talked about kind of the value sectors. Just to finish off here, another kind of warning sign here is if you look at what happened in 2007 or 2000 when the markets topped, um, is the the, the 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 market became less and less broad. Right. Like after the first crack in the summer of 2007 and the rebound, most sectors, you know, the S&P, NASDAQ and Dow all made new highs in October 2007. But the banks, the brokers, insurance companies, um, the small caps, you know, um, you know, a lot of sectors, especially in the financials, did not make new highs and actually were trading under their 150 or 200 day moving averages. In, in in October of 2007, and again, if you look at now, the the broker dealers, um, uh, the yeah, what 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 it what it looks like, Dave. I think you're saying is that um, only like the dividend stocks, like the MLPs and those plays, and some of the shale oil producers. Those are the the plays that are still uh, have good relative strength. So the, the safer, like, utilities and dividend well, stocks, you could, but you look, it's see, the more momentum ones that are breaking down, yeah, right? Yeah, well, not even momentum, but just tons of sectors are breaking down. And, again, if you want to look at momentum, like, the momentum is now the airlines or, like, Apple. So all that momentum money is actually moving into few and few stocks. And that, too, is a sign that the bull market is, is kind of probably in its final, you know, legs here. 
I, I think that's a good point. And I mean, this this bull market that we've had has been artificial. I I, do, I don't think, uh, besides maybe the shale oil revolutions and a few of these technology, that there's there's been uh, some fundamental stuff and some technology stuff. There are some profits, like Intuitive Surgical has an enormous amount of profits uh, that they made. But yeah, a, a lot of these technology stocks don't have profits. They just have revenue, and they're starting to use some of the same stupid metrics uh, as. <laughs> as the technology bubble, right? Yeah, no, no, like, and again, so have... I talk about this in my book. I actually show the price to sales of, you know, the Facebooks and the Twitters and the Yelps and the 3D well, print. Well, Facebook, Facebook has profits, though, at least. Yeah, right? yeah, so but, it's, but, it's but, not... but it has high margins. Like, you can, you know, okay. it can probably keep those up. They don't have a huge amount of overhead. But, but uh, basically, I show the price to sales of all these things and show that they're just ridiculously kind, kind of, overvalued and, and like I said just talking about you know it's the same thing as 2000 like you just mentioned that you know now these things have you know price to sales of 20 times not price to earnings of 30 or 20 times so it, it's just and you know do, do, you, do you think these technology stocks then are going to be a buy then at some point like okay. triple d 3d systems and intuitive search I, 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 I'm not going to get into it in this podcast we can get in more detail when the time maybe comes but I'm going to okay. do a special report in my newsletter on this, actually, I've got three reports coming out. I got one on maybe these the, the, the problems in the market right now, um, and and then number one on precious metals and how the stocks are cheap, and then the last one is going to be really interesting. And this actually goes to my last philosophy I talk in the book in regards to if you think it was politics or whatever him. But one thing I really believe in is Soros's philosophy is reflexivity, where markets aren't like a reflex from one move to another. So you go from fear to greed and bull to bear, and one of the best reflex rallies that you can take advantage of is after a bubble bursts, even if that sector or stock never goes back into the bubble, as long as it survives, like, for example, the, 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 the stock I use in example is Crocs. It makes those crappy uh, plastic shoes, right? Yeah. The Crocs was a bubble in the 2007 market. It actually peaked at $70 a share. And it went to $1 a share, actually 76, I think it was 87 cents a share or something like that at the bottom of the financial crisis, it rebounded to as high as $30 a share. So it, 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 when, like, it, it's not just like, it doesn't even have to be an Amazon or a price line, these stocks, which obviously if you bought at the bottom in 01, 02, you're pretty happy about 12 years later, right? Yeah. It, it doesn't have to be one of those. It's just a lot of these companies after they fall that, you know, that, that, that I talked about again, it's kind of re, it combines reflexivity with maximum pessimism that after they fall 90, 95% of value, a lot of these things on the reflex rally are going to go 500, 1,000, 2,000%. And that is that's where the great, that's where the kind of, the, you know, the, um, um, the value is going to lie. That's pretty interesting. I think that probably explains why George Soros hasn't even been buying gold stocks lately, or he bought them like a few months ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Soros, you always got to take what he says with a grain of salt, because he's a classic hedge fund manager. He's not really telling you what he's doing. He's a politician. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's a, like a, he's politician, a politician. Hedge fund managers, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't like his, pol his politics at all, and I don't really trust anything he says. But when his 13 Fs come out, I guess you can find out the truth, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, in wrapping up this interview, Dave, um, please tell our listeners about your website and your newsletter, and then um, where they can go get your new book. Yeah, my book is only an uh, ebook right now because of the time-sensitive, um, uh, you know, material in it. You go to Amazon.com, just type in my name, David Skarika, you'll see Collapse show up. It's actually the number one uh, stock investing book in both Kindle and the regular bookstore for a while. Um, uh, if you, you know, if, um, so if you have a Kindle, buy the Kindle version. Even if you don't have a Kindle, um, write me um, at, 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 on my email address, um, which is addicted to profits at hotmail.com, and just show me a copy, and I'll, I'll fire up the PDF with proof of purchase. Uh, my, my website is addictedtoprofits.net, uh, which we have a, a 20 by weekly a year, weekly updates. Um, I give uh, Actually, if you buy a copy of the book, we have a special offer. And we have a link to the website there in the book for um, uh, 300, uh, basically 50% off uh, the newsletter. And finally, uh, my newsletter is called uh, – my, my um, hedge fund is called Maximum Pessimism Investment Corp. After John Templeton's philosophies, it's and uh, if you're an investor outside the United States, sorry, I can't take any Americans due to the offshore reg due to the regulations. But if you're an investor listening in Europe or Canada, et cetera, and you're interested in these um, 
uh, philosophies. Um, we actually have a very small minimum, a very good structure on the fund. So you can write me at info at maxpassinvest.com and um, find out more information on the uh, fund. And I think the fund will be actually trading sometime next month. Very good. Congratulations on okay, that. Thanks. Well, um, thanks again for your time, Dave, and hopefully we'll have you back on again soon. Thank you.